Right, so welcome to our first international workshop on multimodal understanding for the web and social media. <clears throat> we are quite grateful to have you here today. This is our first edition of this workshop, and we hope that we can <clears throat> continue this collaboration and um, exchange of ideas and discussions. I will briefly introduce basically what this workshop is about and why we are doing it, and then we'll go on with the uh, planned program. So first of all, why do we want to do, do this workshop? So MUWS, or the, what it stands for, is Multimodal Understanding for the Web and Social Media. The main reason for this is we have seen a lot of uh, applications that are coming out nowadays that doesn't require only having uh, approaches from NLP or computer vision, but it requires a um, combination of these approaches or their application in human computation or information retrieval. So there are multiple modalities in the data that we, that we deal at the moment. So if you think about the web, web is obviously is also multimodal. There's not just image or text and they don't appear separately, but they're combined together and they appear together. So from the perspective of computational models, it also makes sense to consider the joint context together of um, image and text pairs, for instance, or in audiovisual data, where we should not just focus on a single modality, but uh, basically consider the whole context together. So this is basically our in intuition behind this coming, coming up from the computational science. And we wanna basically discuss and um, build models that could understand data on the web and the social media. Obviously this is not just the one um, motivation that we have, another motivation that we have and would like to continue on it is um, applications or also taking theories from semiotics um, research. So semiotics here also focus on how the meaning is built, how the image um, adds a meaning to the text when they're occurring together in a single context or vice versa, how basically how image and text or any kind of a multiple modalities when they're used together, they build a single uh, context and based on that, the, basically the meaning. So this is basically our main motivation for starting this workshop, work, workshop series. And we would like to take this further with uh, some collaboration from the community of computational approach, as well as from media studies uh, on, on theory of semiotics and so on. And for this year, these were the topics of our interest for the workshop. So you can see there's a multimodal. I think it's, maybe it's just me, but I just see the PowerPoint window, I don't see the slide. Okay. Can anyone confirm? Can you see a slide number three? Yeah, I cannot see, I, I can only see the first slide. Okay, then sorry, I will quickly reshare. No, it that, won't. That usually helps. Can you see slide number three? Uh, yes. Yes. How about four? No. Uh, just three. We, we basically see like the, the PowerPoint window, not, not the... Okay, not how about slide. now? Yeah. Can you yep. see the now, changes? Now it's four or five, yeah. Okay, so I will not make it a full screen for now. Maybe it's not working for some reason. But um, basically, this is what I was talking about. So why we want to have this workshop series, as I said, uh, combining computational and media studies uh, researchers bring them together to basically focus on multimodal problems. This has already been happening before and we wanna also take it further by including maybe research from semiotics. And for these workshops, these are the topics of interest. There is a multimodal event detection, uh, emotion recognition, uh, you can think of multimodal question answering and so on. So, and also specifically image text relations, specifically from the semiotics uh, research. And this is basically how we could manage uh, to put up this program and this workshop together with the help of our organization and the uh, program committee. So uh, my name is Shadow Takimov. Maybe I didn't say it in the beginning. So my colleague here is Gulal Singh Chima is here. We have Mark um, Kastner from Kyoto University and there is Rajiv Ratan Shah from uh, Delhi and then Karan Sika from uh, Princeton SRI. And on the right side, you can see our um, great program committee who have worked really well to provide basically 
good quality reviews for uh, to ensure quality of our workshop. And this is what uh, we, we can see today. So we have accepted four papers out of six. We have received 18 reviews, basically three review per paper. And uh, we ensure that we picked uh, high quality publications for this uh, edition. And today we'll have one keynote talk and two invited talks on top of four paper presentations. This is what I've just said, basically, you can see the full program also in this URL. You can also see linked uh, papers uh, with their open access PDFs uh, that are already linked there in the workshop uh, website. And next would be basically what I could introduce. Um, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce today uh, Professor uh, Ichiro Ide. Um, he's a professor at Nagoya University since uh, 2020 as an associate professor. His research interests range from analysis and indexing to retargeting of multimedia contents, especially in the large scale broadcast video archives, mostly on news, cooking and sports co uh, content. Today, he'll be talking about tailoring applications to users through multimodal understanding. So Professor Ida, it's great pleasure to have you here. So the floor is yours. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Actually, today I'm not talking anything about uh, new sports or cooking, <laughs> so it's kind of a pity, but uh, I will introduce something a little bit different than those topics. Uh, okay, so thank you very much for inviting me, and as, as I saw the, uh, the first uh, page of the slides, I saw the beautiful city of Lyon, and you know, I, I miss going to Lyon. I think I've been there like 10 years ago, it's a nice city. So I hope we could go there, but unfortunately, it's still not possible. Okay, slide, share my slides. Okay, sharing it. I need to. Uh, it. Okay. So can you see my slide? I have the title page. Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. So uh, let's start. So thank you again for uh, inviting me to this uh, nice uh, workshop. Uh, so today the talk will be tailoring applications to users through multimodal understanding. So that's uh, rather general topic. Uh, yes. So oh, so that's well, I have my face also there. So that's me. Introduction. So uh, the self introduction is already introduced by. Uh, Chair, but still, I just wrote it down here. So I basically finished my uh, PhD at the University of Tokyo, and then I worked at uh, National Institute of Informatics. That's an uh, informatics uh, national institute in Japan, in Tokyo. Then um, I joined Nagoya University, my current affiliation, 2004. And then since then, I've been working here. Um, I, I've been staying in the University of Amsterdam for one year, and also um, in the uh, University of Rennes for multiple times in total, like six months. Uh, or during this period too. Okay, so then two years ago, I became a professor as so I'm still working here. So my research interest is uh, both applications and fundamentals, but basically in multimedia, multimodal context. So basically the idea is to understand the relation between different media and then try to uh, make use of this understanding to uh, useful multimedia contents. So uh, the contents of the talk to today is, uh, um, there are roughly two topics. The first one is travel destination recommendation. Uh, the second one is image captioning. So those are, uh, especially the second one is rather um, uh, general. The first one is to find geographic regions where people have similar experiences based on social media posting. So basically based on what people post on the web, we think that um, that is what people are interested in, um, in those locations. Um, so the images are analyzed to extract implicit, uh, well, that's in a sense non-verbal experiences because although we, we could have like um, annotations that's rather explicit, but uh, we, we think that there are implicit things that are not, they're not hidden, but they're, they're apparent in the images, but they're not really uh, annotated or written down. So okay, we would like to make use of those. Um, just roughly like the atmosphere, stuff like that. Um, for the image captioning, uh, it's not simple image captioning. We try to quantify the so-called imageability. This is a psycholinguistic concept uh, of words and sentences. And based on this imageability, we try to generate captions with different levels of imageability. So we try to control 
um, how imageable a, a caption could be. So the first one is travel, tailored travel destination recommendation. So um, demand for tailored traveling is increasing um, because the people used to just go on like uh, organized tours. They don't really decide anything. They just get on the, the, the plane and then they're, they're, they're just taken around all the places. But recently people are not more like, experienced in traveling. So frequent travelers prefer to decide the destination by themselves. But in order to do that, uh, especially recently, thanks to the web, there's so many, it's a large volume of information. Available travel information is increasing. And it's just too too much information for someone to decide what to do. I mean, there, there is so, uh, there's so many things. So the deciding the destination is time consuming. I mean, that's kind of the fun part, but still it could be overwhelming. So um, we thought that tailored recommendation of destinations will be uh, a good support for people to decide where to go. So yeah, you want to go where and yeah. So um, here we consider that the recommendation of destination is usually done by a, a keyword text query, keywords or genres, or basically in words, we, we type in whatever we're interested in. Um, but actually it's sometimes difficult to explicitly describe what we want to see. We just uh, have uh, the preferences or expected atmosphere and experiences, but not really uh, uh, possible to and explicitly write in words. I mean, we could type in some multiple keywords, but that's not exactly sometimes not exactly what we want. So, um, so this family wants to visit. If they have some kind of idea in mind, so it's like there's a temple, they're like very nice, tasty sweets and stuff like that. But then how can we express this atmosphere? Okay, we can write exciting activities, very nice scenery, delicious sweets, but that's not really probably what, what we can find in the, the, in the web, on the web or in, in some um, sightseeing um, information. So instead of describing it uh, by text, we just try to uh, search uh, this kind of uh, destination just based on uh, uh, activities or scenes or uh, experiences. So, I mean, although it's not the same, we, it, uh, this family would be happy to find a place that there's this beautiful sightseeing places and nice suites and stuff like that. So uh, to facilitate the search for destinations similar to a familiar one. So although we might not be able to express explicitly where what we want to experience, we know places that we've already been. And we say, okay, I want to go to some place similar to this place. I mean, where we can experience something similar to that place, something like that. So in order to do that, we need a similarity metric to uh, find such, such uh, places. So the research goal is similar geo region mining, focusing on the seasonal difference. So uh, although the, the destination itself is important, also the sea, uh, season could be important because if you want to see certain flowers or certain um, exp experience certain atmospheres, it probably needs to be at a certain time of the year, unless you're going to like, I don't know, uh, somewhere very tropical that it's always summer or something like that, but usually that's not the case. So um, here we introduced the concept of seasonal georegion. So it's both uh, the season and the, the, and the geographic area. So uh, in this example, uh, on the left side, okay, one place throughout the year that's called geo regions without any season or anything in this you have like many things happening in one place like that you can have cherry blossoms you can have festivals you can have what, parades or anything, everything like that but that's just too complicated everything is mixed up actually you don't experience this at the same time so you can't really do everything when you visit but actually the, the actuality is in april you uh, experience a cherry blossom and some small festival. But if you go there in summer, you experience this big, huge festival. So those are separate. So we are going to separate these. Um, so based, basically based on this concept, we find, try to find similar or it could also be non-similar. You might not want to, you might not want to go to a certain place. So find similar or non-similar uh, uh, seasonal geo regions using the similarity metric based on people's interests. So here, um, Okay, I'll just add a little bit more explicitly explain what the seasonal geo region is. So it's basically geographically and temporally continuous region. So it's kind of a 
three-dimensional things. Uh, or, or it's the geographic area plus the temporal continuity. So where people share common activities or experiences. So we basically uh, focus on uh, uh, photos uploaded to social media uh, and then try to find this uh, continuous uh, uh, region. Okay, so it's, it's a bit uh, kind of uh, extended concept of a region, a geographic region. Okay, so let's look at this um, this map. I think this is Kyoto, I'm not really sure, but it's, it's some place, okay. So, and then uh, let's see, we can find like this uh, seasonal region A, it's the, the blue points and B with red points. Um, well, actually, I don't know why this is like that. Some areas probably could not, no, this is a bit strange, sorry. It should be in different colors. And then there's this uh, C with the green color, and I think some of which either of these need to be purple. I think I just throw the thing. So in this blue zero seasonal zero region, it's apparently uh, in winter people go skiing there. Then in this uh, red one, apparently in spring people go to see the flowers. Then the green places, I think it's the cherry blossom, and people go there to to see and enjoy the festival. Okay, sorry. And then here, um, people go there in summer to enjoy this huge festival. So these are like, uh, so it could be on, at, at the same location, but in at different timings of the year. So how we do this? We basically uh, uh, use a lot of, uh, get a lot of social media photos and then try to uh, decide the seasonal geo-region boundaries. So that is done basically by the clustering um, in both uh, geographic, uh, uh, space and also in uh, time space. So that's not going to be into the details. And then we try to, sorry, uh, describe, oh, sorry. So, so yeah, this is now different, yeah. So this is how we cluster, okay? So we find clusters in attitude, longitude and season space. We try to find this kind of clusters. So I mean, just, just like small topics about how to make a better cluster and things like that. Yes, skip that. So uh, we do the clustering. And then next, we need to extract the features from each seasonal geo region because we need we want to compare the similarity. So what are the features here? It's basically, we try to extract. Um, uh, okay, that's going to be talked later. So basically, we extract features from each photo taken in this seasonal geo region, um, and then we basically accumulate those uh, features and then um, describe the whole region. So um, this is actually some. Going to be some examples shown here. So, how do we describe the features? So, basically, social media photos taken in the seasonal geo region. So, that could be hundreds of thousands of photos. Uh, we consider that these reflect people's interests and experiences. So, it's not like satellite imagery. It's the people who focus on something. So, that's why they take these pictures. So, we think that is what people people are interested in. Um, for the contents, we well, this work has been done a little bit uh, before. So, now probably we could use some better. Uh, tools, but at this time moment, we uh, use this thing called visual concepts. So this this uh, visual concept is not limited to objects, but it's also scenery, places, and so on. So uh, if you're given this picture, there are lots of things in it, but um, um, so we apply visual concept detector to it. And then uh, from this, we can extract uh, object, uh, like uh, the sakura, the cherry blossom, and trees. And then the scene is a festival, outdoor crowd, this kind of visual concept. So actually this is going to be uh, represented by a histogram. And then we have many photos taken at this, in this seasonal geo region. So each of them will output this kind of um, uh, uh, visual concepts uh, histogram. And then they're all combined into one. So it's uh, accumulated. So this is uh, considered as the uh, feature of this re seasonal duration. So and then this is applied to all of these clusters that we that were extracted. So A, B, and C, and so on. But then um, there are like uh, visual concepts that appear everywhere. So we apply this uh, uh, TFIDF idea, then try to uh, uh, consider the frequency that they, they tend to appear in general. Okay, so 
Yeah, so outdoor is quite common, so that's not so important. But like the cherry blossom, sakura, snow, ski, they're probably a little bit more uh, important than the other concepts. So that's reweighting based on TFI. So, so this is adjusted. And then finally, also, yeah, this is what we get in the end. Okay, then we just basically compare those histograms between different uh, seasonal regions. Yeah, so that is done by normalized cross correlation. Uh, then we detect uh, similar so seasonal georegion period based on the uh, uh, similarity. So if it's above some threshold, it's uh, considered as similar. So the data set we used is, was the YFCC 100 mega uh, M, 100 M. And then uh, we only worked in, 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 inside Japan. So we selected about uh, 910 kilo, uh, that's 910,000 photos taken inside Japan. Um, and as the visual concept detector, ResNet based uh, places 365 was used. So that recognized basically 365 visual concepts. Um, so these are the similar seasonal georegions that we extracted. There was, um, so we basically set the threshold to 0 0.80. Um, and then um, at of course, they're like very similar seasonal georegions and not so similar seasonal georegions. So those like zero were like 109,000. That's, that's most of the, the, the pairs. So actually, we detected 633 uh, seasonal georegions, so basically clusters. And then we compared all the combinations of these. So that is uh, 200,000 uh, pairs. And out of those, we only selected those above 0 0.8. So those are the very similar ones. And that uh, totaled in around 5,000 pairs. So those were like the, considered as the uh, similar seasonal georegions all throughout the, the entire Japan. So you might be interested in seeing what those look like. Uh, okay. So these are the examples of the detected similar seasonal georegions. So the first one um, is the pairs similar only when an event is held. So it's like a, on a specific event. So the one to the left is uh, our pictures from the uh, Yokota Air, Air Force Base. So that's a, a, uh, basically a US Air Base in, in near Tokyo. So in summer, every year they have this uh, uh, open base thing. So people can public, they, they, they open to the public so people can join there. And then to the right is the Iruma Base. I think it's, uh, I don't know. It's 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 not uh, there in the they're both U.S. air bases, but they're a bit uh, they're they're not so far, but they're in a different place. So they have it in November. So these are different um, air festivals at military bases, but still you see as you see they're quite similar. Uh, then the next one is uh, pairs that are similar only in some season. So this is more natural stuff. So the one to the left is uh, a zoo in Osaka in December. Then to the right is the park in Nagasaki in November. So uh, as you might know, Japan is really, really going from the north to the south. Uh, we have like natural phenomena at quite different timings of the year throughout the whole country. So although this is just November and December, but this could happen to be like uh, September in the north, right? So you can find this kind of uh, similar natural phenomena uh, throughout the country. So if you want to visit some famous spots for these beautiful red leaves, um, you can say, okay, I want to go to some places um, that I have visited before like this, but not in this area, but in some other area, then you can find it like this. So for the evaluations, um, we evaluated um, uh, two things. One is uh, whether the similarity metric is uh, appropriate or not. And the other is that considering the seasonality was effective or not. So, so this is the details I'm going to skip most of it, but uh, we experimented on uh, basically students. Um, uh, and then basically we prepared uh, 53 triplets of um, seasonal region X and A and B. And actually um, uh, A and B are selected so that either of it is similar, actually similar to X, but the other is not similar to X. So we want people to see uh, we want to see if people also do the same judging. Uh, judging. Okay, uh, so let's see. So as a result, actually 87% of the pairs 
uh, matched with the human sense. So what was selected from our metric was 87% similar to what people will think about it too. So I think that's not bad. Um, this one was the best match with humans. So for the, the one on top is the X as the target region. And then uh, the similar one was the one to the left and the, the non-similar ones was run on, on the right. So all of these are about flowers or different flowers. And they usually they appear in different timings of the year. So um, actually, if you see at the features, it would look like that. So, so both of them are like florist shop flowers, but not really the same kind of flowers. And this one did not match with human sense. The one on top, is, and that's the air base, uh, open base thing. And But actually, the one that we compared on the left is uh, just a normal airport photos. But on the right is, I don't know, this is probably another air festival, but it's more fo focusing more on the sky. So they apparently, they do not look similar, but actually to people, uh, the one on the right side, it looks more like military aircrafts. And the one on the left side is more uh, civilian aircraft. To people, uh, military aircrafts are quite similar to the original uh, target. So that was a different, um, judgment from the system that to the what people say. Because I mean, I think uh, this uh, places 365 does not really differentiate military aircraft and civilian aircraft. So they just say airplanes. Yeah, so that makes a, a bit different judgment between the, the people. Yeah, so um, let's see about the seasonality. So we, we compared the, the geo region without the season and the geo region with the season. Uh, this is of course quite apparent so um, actually 3,000 non-similar geo region pairs became similar by considering seasonality. So um, this, as you see at this example on the left side, throughout the year, it shows various stuff. So it shows like the uh, snow festival and like some very warm weather and stuff like that. But if you actually um, split this based on seasonality, uh, we can actually find there's like there's this festival but just like, uh, like a festival in summer and also festival with snow and ice and stuff like that. So those are quite different and they happen at different times of the year. So that seemed to be uh, effective. So this is a uh, user interface that we made based on this. So it's already playing. So if you focus on this location that's near Nagoya, where I am, then um, it is in spring. You see uh, lots, of, lots of beautiful flowers. And then you say, okay, let's please show me somewhere related to this inside Japan. So that's now somewhere outside of Tokyo. And it says, okay, here, if you go there, um, you see, and also that is like in, in summer. Okay. So you see something similar. So in that, this way, people can find a place that you can find similar uh, experiences um, in different timings of the year and also in different areas. And that's how we do this. So that is the first part of the talk. I hope I still have time. Uh, yes. So the second topic is tailored image caption. So let's think about the mental image of concepts. So if you look at these pictures, uh, go to the left side, you see like lots of different things. On the right side, you see leaves. Okay. So humans can easily understand. And actually, this is these are images that were searched from these two keywords, peaceful and leaf. So the ones in on the left are results of the image search based on peaceful. I don't know. Yeah, well, they look peaceful. Okay, they have different backgrounds, different contents. If you search leaf, they're always uh, about the same object, although they might look different. But they're basically leaves. They're always in a forest and so. On. So uh, peaceful is quite abstract and leaf is quite concrete. That is basically the original idea of this research. So we want to uh, somehow uh, quantify this. So for peaceful, we want a low value. For leaf, we want a high value. So those will come on here on the on the bar. And then if you say something, that's even more abstract than peaceful. And then morning, probably somewhere in a bit in the middle, reckless a bit closer to the concrete side. And then hammer, usually they, look, they always look the same. So we want to do this kind of uh, quantification. So how we do, do we do this? 
um, actually we found that there is a concept called imageability in psycholinguistics. Uh, for example, say cat, it's very clear mental image, it's rather easy. For peaceful, it's rather unclear mental image, it's hot, it's hot. And thing, okay, thing can be anything. So it's, there's basically no mental image, it's very hard. Um, so these are basically, it's the same idea. So they have values. Actually, there are dictionaries that have uh, this kind of values that you can search for. Um, well, here it says data has, data has dictionaries are available in various languages, but usually they're very small, uh, they're very limited vocabulary, and also it's handcrafted. So if you want to add a new vocabulary, you have to perform like um, um, subjective experiment or like subjects for like 20 people or something, like that. and it's quite tough. So it's not so easy to expand the vocabulary. Um, so we've thought that can we estimate imageability using images? So that's basically social media images. The core assumption is that the variety of visual features in web crawled images, they loosely approximate mental image. That's, our, that's kind of a strong assumption, but I, we thought that this idea is interesting. So um, if it's less defined in mental image, we thought that uh, the, web, the web images also should probably have lots of variety. And if it's closely defined in mental image, all the images will probably look similar. That's, that, that was our assumption. So that was a peaceful and leaf. So peaceful actually had lots of different things and leaf usually visually is quite similar. So we try to decide to mine the image databases based on this assumption. So how do we do this? So we basically collect lots of images for a certain concept. So in this case, leaf. So for each visual feature, we make this feature vector and then um, so we uh, cross comparison. We, perform press comparison between all images of leaf. So uh, in this SI matrix, uh, the, basic, the vertical and the horizontal axis are basically the images. And then we basically compare all the image features of all the combinations of Im uh, images. And then basically what we want to see is that if lots of images in this uh, concept, in this case leaf, are similar, probably this matrix will show like very high values among all a lot of combinations. If they're uh, not so similar, most of the uh, elements in this matrix will be very small. So basically based on this idea, we um, calculate the eigenvalues of this matrix, then try to um, learn which kind of matrix um, shows um, high imageability and which kind of matrix shows low image. So that is trained by a regressor, random forest. Then once this uh, regressor is trained, we get this value. So that's basically the estimated imageability. So um, for the evaluation, we try to predict imageability for a set of words. Um, and for this, we collected a lot of images from the web, but actually some, for some words, it was quite difficult to, uh, to gather uh, sufficient number of images. So actually we had to limit the number of words to 587, that's not so big, uh, but each of them has 5,000 images each. Uh, so we, used, they, we combined like Google images and Bing and tried to collect uh, uh, 5,000 images for each of these words. Uh, and then the ground truth we, we got from the psycholinguistic dictionary. Yeah, okay. So for the, the methods, the proposed method uses only image. Uh, comparative method only uses text. So there is actually a similar work uh, that uses only text. Okay. So the, re the result looks like this. So um, well, basically, if, if you look at this full method, that's our proposed method, uh, the correlation between the, the values in the dictionary with our method is around 0 0.63, not bad, but actually uh, if you compare it with just with text, it's, they, they're, they're higher, they're like 0 0.7. But for the mean average error of the actual values, our method was, a, was better than the text. So I think it was quite promising. Yeah, so this is actually the distribution of the estimated scores with the, the, the ground truth. So uh, the blue points represent the ground truth for each word on the uh, horizontal axis and the vertical axis is the imageability value. Um, so uh, the red points are based on R result, based on image, and the green points are based on the text. So, well, uh, most of them are quite uh, good, but uh, if we see the, uh, the correlation, I think, yeah. Yeah, so for the correlation, the text is a bit better, but it's, it looks like this. Okay, 
So um, next comes uh, the improvement. So we try to combine both images and text. So can different modalities tell us different things about the same concept? So actually for the images, we basically did uh, the, the same thing. Uh, model actually differentiated a high level uh, image feature and low level image features. So the high level basically represented objects, so that's a visual concept and things like that. And then for the low level, it's just edges and textures and all those low level image features. And then for language, actually we used the text and word embedding, of course, but also we added the uh, pronunciation information. So that's basically language information, but not really text, it's phonetic information. Actually, as a result, you see that if we add the text, combine, uh, combine text and image, we get really high correlation, and also very low um, mean average error. So that means uh, combining image and text is really uh, effective. Yeah, and actually it turned out that using the pronunciation, pronunciation is quite effective. So uh, based on this, we made a data set. Uh, you can download it from this QR code if you're interested in. Uh, so we estimated the image rate of 2,413 words. So those are not necessarily in the dictionaries. So those are only calculated by us. Um, so we compared, we used the image mining, text mining, printing mining, and we just compared uh, how uh, they can estimate the image rate in, in a different way. So we can just analyze uh, the results. Uh, we basically looked into the cross-modal outliers and visualized the phonetic space and did all sorts of analysis, analysis like this. So actually there is a uh, interface to, uh, to browse all these uh, information. So in the end, uh, this is the last thing I want to talk. So um, based on the imageability, we want to uh, do image capture. So can imageability be used for, for multimodal understanding? That's the question. The idea is to use imageability as a metric to control the, ab the abstractness of the image captions. Um, so basically we try to parameterize the length and imageability uh, and then to change the perception style of the output image caption. So yeah, so the idea is you, you give an image and then there's like measurability and length uh, slide bar. You can adjust uh, the length and also the imageability and tell the system to output something that reflects the, the parameters. Yeah. Yeah, then you have, so like for example, if you have low imageability in low, uh, short uh, caption, then the output of this image caption will be like a close-up of, of a person holding a baseball bat. It's very short and also, uh, well, it's a bit uh, abstract. But if you set like high imageability and long, so say a baseball game with a batter, catcher, umpire, and the food stuff at home at all. I mean, I don't know if you want this, but you can adjust it to the length and also the image that you want according to what you want to use this caption for. So the approach. Uh, first, uh, we need to have a training, we need to have training data, right? So, uh, but actually, unfortunately, there is no uh, data set that has like different abstractness scores for uh, text. So we actually modified an existing um, data set. So that's basically MS Coco. Uh, it has like captions, like five captions for one image. Um, then we actually uh, went, used uh, WordNet to um, uh, modify the, the given captions to a more uh, general or abstract ones. You just go up the uh, WordNet hierarchy and replace the words. So in that way, we can generate um, more abstract caption. It's a bit difficult to generate the more concrete ones, but we just went, went up upwards to the abstract side. And then um, for each of the, the captions, the, the training captions, uh, we actually made a method to um, give imageability score for each sentence. So it's not, it's not per word. So based on the word imageability, we, we made a method to calculate the sentence imageability. So that is automatically done based on the dictionary. And I mean, in case some words are missing, you can also use the, the estimated ones. Then, so that way we can uh, make a data set that has an abstractness score plus a uh, caption. Okay. okay, it's actually, so that means we need to make a more abstract caption for a, from a given caption. And then we label the sentence visibility. Then after that, we have the data set. So we basically uh, 
train a model to target different imageability and length. So this is the result. So um, you can generate captions with different perceptions. For this given image, you set the length level one to four. And then for each of the length level, you can set a low, mid, high imageability. So that the short and low imageability to be some organisms are playing in a baseball game. That's really strange, but <laughs> it's abstract. If you go for like a long and high imageability to say a baseball game with a better catcher umpire and a food sub at home play. So, uh, and of, of course there's everything in, in, in between these. Okay. So that was like, it looks interesting. Um, they actually actually uh, evaluated based on perception of abstract, abstractness uh, through crowdsource study. We asked, we basically gave people um, like two captions generated in this way and ask which one is more abstract, things like that. Uh, as a result, the Peterman correlation to the target imageability was approximately 0 0.7. So that's also not bad. At all. Okay. So, uh, so summary, so we introduced the tailored applications to users through multimodal understanding. So in two cases, travel destination recommendation um, and image caption. So for future directions, we still need to consider higher level concepts for the recommendation. And for the image captioning, we should consider other metrics than imageability. So there are all, all other different uh, concepts in psycholinguistics, and also uh, things that we can think of. Okay. So these are the references. Uh, if you're interested in, I, I can give you this list later. Um, and thanks to the colleagues and students, and especially I highlighted Mark here because he actually did uh, the latter <laughs> work, and also he invited me. Today, so. <laughs> but otherwise, uh, all of these people, mostly students, they helped us uh, do this work. Uh, thank you very much. I hope I'm on time. But yeah, thank you very much. The timing is perfect. Um, oh, that's so good. I would, yeah, I will open the floor for questions. I yeah. have some of my own, but first I want to ask from the audience if they have any questions. Okay, maybe I can start quickly. So yes. thanks a lot. So I, I, I like both talks. I think the second one obviously is something that I'm also interested in. So abstractness yeah. of images uh, with respect yes. to the captions. I just didn't mm -hmm. get, maybe I missed it, the part about this uh, image this input from the psycholinguist dictionary, does it give like a, some sort of a quantifiable number for a abstractness? Yeah, for yeah, word? yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's basically a number. Okay. So it's yeah. saying high abstractness, low, low abstractness, something like this. Well, oh, it, it's more really a number. So it's something, some value between zero and one. I mean, I think it's basically uh, based on uh, subjective experiment between one and seven, was it? Um, mm -hmm. It's basically a Likert yes. scale. Yeah, it's, it's an average of that. So it's somewhere mm -hmm. in between these numbers. Okay, good, thanks. So follow-up yeah. question since nobody raised their hand. So I didn't get the part, how did the phonetics feature really help? Like why does the pronunciation of a word makes a difference in terms of text? Okay, um, I didn't really explain that in detail. <laughs> we are not really sure, but actually there's something called sound symbolism. So okay. basically uh, there is a theory, theory that um, sound has some kind of relation between the mental perception of um, the uh, concept. And we're not really sure how it really affects, but uh, it seems it's quite strong. So uh, that is kind of uh, made use of in the, in the, the model. I think. Actually, this is actually currently done by a PhD student now, and he actually he is now starting this. So uh, we will investigate it in the future okay. in more detail. Yeah, yeah because it's, I haven't it's seen quite it before. It's quite interesting. No, I've yeah. ne we've never seen it before, and it's quite interesting. So, yeah. If if I can jump in, I think we no, did some ahead. analysis on that. Um, oh, we actually did. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's it's a little bit a mixed story. Like there's there's a little bit sound symbolism involved, but there's also a thing that usually like very abstract words tend to be very long. So there's um, you have very long words with certain. Uh, uh, sounds and like uh, syllables, which don't appear in shorter words, which are more concrete. So uh, there might be like some kind of trained bias that uh, such like very abstract, very uh, difficult words just contain certain syllables, which don't appear anywhere else. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, so actually the, the complicated and difficult concepts, they usually are like Latin origin and also yeah. like they have like, uh, like, 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 in, like in symbolism or psycholinguistics, in, you know, these uh, <laughs> suffixes, mm. suffixes so are- Actually, yeah, like, if, yeah. if you're good, 
go to yeah. slide uh, 38. Uh, we, we actually did some um, yeah. Yeah, actually, some we analysis did it, yeah. on et etymology and like all the abstract words were basically like Latin, Greek and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, I think it's related. Mm -hmm. So in the end, if you think about it, it could also be like a simple what we know from NLP, like character embeddings or some, something like this could also capture it because if you look at the overlap of it's a character yeah. within a given word. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is one thing, but actually we thought that the pronunciation would be more interesting. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course, the characters could be like a first step, yes. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Are there any other questions from the audience? Okay, Gulal. Gulal, can you talk? Hello. I, I don't think we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, now no, we can. Uh, uh, there's no background noise, right? Or is, is there? No. I can hear you. Okay. So uh, thank you for an interesting talk. So uh, my question is with respect to the first part uh, where you talked about visual concepts. Uh, yeah. I saw that the places 365 was the visual uh -huh. concept, like the 365 scenes. Uh, mm -hmm. Were there other visual concepts besides those 365 visual concepts? And I, I might have missed that, but... Um, well, so basically what you see here, like, sorry. I mean, I don't really have a whole list here, but it's basically things like, I just need to show the... So it's things like that here, okay? So we have like florist shop, field, forest, botanical garden, these kind of things. Orchard, forest. Okay, so so those 365 visual concepts, which are the same. Yeah. Okay, got it. Yeah, so actually what, what I mentioned as future work is, yes, we did need to add more um, concepts. Mm -hmm. So these are basically scenery. Uh -huh. And then we also want to include more experience uh -huh. or activities. So, activities, yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Right. yeah. Like some something of a sort of if there is an event or event information or event concept yeah or an action as a concept like a baseball mm -hmm. I don't know a football yeah. game uh, yeah things like that yeah yeah so but you know it basically should work on any of these concepts so yeah, yeah so we would like to add those okay. all right any other questions from the audience. Then I would say thank you very much, Professor Ida. Uh, yes, thank you very much. A great pleasure yeah. and hope to see you again sometime in person as well. Yes, I hope to see you in person. Yes. Uh, and actually, um, since it was a bit earlier than I expected, I was still doing the, 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 the remaining part of the workshop. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, thank um, you. All right, thank you. Then we should uh, move on with our program. Yeah. Um, so the next talk would be by Dr. Xiao Tseng. Um, she has completed her PhD in applied linguistics at the University of Bremen in 2010, and she spe specializes in developing discourse methods for analyzing visual and audiovisual text structures and content. And today she will be giving a talk on multimodal discourse approach to narrative strategies of online news videos. Xiao, could you please share your screen? You are muted. Okay, I'm trying. Um, okay. Did you join via Zoom or? Yeah, I am. Okay. I did. It should be easier. I guess she will reconnect again. In the meantime, for the next presenters, it would be good as I wrote before to join the 
the present uh, for the workshop via Zoom, not using the default web browser. Some of the functionalities don't really work on the browser, I guess. Let's wait a bit. Uh, ah, she's here. Okay. Yes, we can see it now. You can see my screen? Yes. Um, okay. I think it works. Uh, let me. Can you see my screen? Yeah. We can oh. see the slides. Okay, sorry for the uh, delay. Um, can you see the full screen, the first page? Yeah, yeah, we can. Okay, so I should just go ahead. I guess I waste uh, three minutes already. Um, okay, um, thank you, Shirsa, for inviting me. Um, this presentation is based on an um, interdisciplinary research project, Fake Narrative. Um, in this research project, we try to combine methods of multimodal discourse analysis. That is the re, uh, approach we are developing at Bremen University. And we combine multimodal discourse analysis with methods of computer science and digital humanities at Hannover and Leipzig universities. And our central research goal is to address um, how to come how to uncover narrative strategies of online news videos that could lead to information uncertainty and that are often used in fake narratives for uh, for example manipulative purposes it is a well-known fact that uh, news reporting nowadays involve a lot of storytelling strategies um, especially audiovisual news reporting encompasses a wide variety of filmmaking strategies nowadays, such as camera features, sequencing, narrative, or dramatic structures. Um, some are very similar to even to Hollywood films. So even authoritative public news outlets nowadays also use a lot of film editing features to engage viewers and to attract their attention. Um, and the Norwegian scholar Yetra Berg um, distinguished the transition between the two models of news reporting. The first one is information model that focuses on reporting factual information based on fact. And the second model started around late 80s or early 90s is called communication model. It focuses on audience comprehension and attention. So there have been a lot of debates about which model is more appropriate for news reporting. Um, nevertheless, uh, most news channels inevitably needs to pursue communication model to some to a certain degree. Um, especially um, nowadays, the, the market driven um, online news channels um, often take a communication model to the extreme. This leads to a news sensationalism or tabloidization. So these kind of narrative strategies have the risk of manipulation and tend to be used to, um, to tend to be used in uh, creating more um, fake narratives. So based on this context, our research project is um, addressed. How do we compare narrative strategies that tries to balance um, factual information and audience engagement? And um, how do we distinguish those from those narrative strategies that contain risk of manipulation and news sensationalism? So this is our central research goal. And in today's talk, I will present a result of a pilot study focusing on narrative strategy of individualization. Um, I will show how to compare different types of individualization in online and public news videos, um, especially how our comparison distinguish, um, distinguishes the sensationalist manipulative news format 
from those more objective authoritative news format. So I focus on individualization because um, individualization strategy is very commonly used in uh, news reporting, especially for engaged audience. So individual stories are very powerful. Individual stories create more vivid information that are closer um, and more attached to the viewers. So many news reporting, instead of reporting only on numbers and events, they use a lot of protagonists and individual stories to attract the viewers' attention and to increase the memory. So um, there have been a lot of empirical evidence showing that in comparison um, to reports, only re reporting numbers and events objectively, uh, news reports with individual stories can increase um, memory of the audience and about the news contents and increase audience risk perception. Um, in our pilot study, we address two main research questions. Um, the first one is how are individualization strategies different in online and public news videos? The second one is can we uncover fake narrative patterns based on analyzing and comparing individualization across two kinds of channels? <clears throat> um, again, the fake narrative pattern, I refer to new narrative patterns that create uncertainty and that could be possibly used for manipulative purposes. So these patterns are very often used in fake news videos. Um, the data in our project include one of the most popular online news channels in Germany that is Bild, uh, Bild TV. And um, we um, select 90 Bild TV uh, news uh, videos and we compare them to Tagesschau videos. Tagesschau is the oldest and most watched public news program in Germany with over 11 million viewers. In this pilot study, we compare um, 90 um, BRTV and, and as I said, um, 70 Tagesschau news videos from the time frame of 1st January to uh, middle of March. As you could imagine, uh, the news topics are around this time are mostly about um, COVID and Ukraine war. And the method uh, we use for analyzing individualization is the multimodal discourse approach to film cohesion. This is the framework we developed a few years ago at the University of Bremen. Um, this method systematically tracks the most dominant narrative elements throughout a film, such as the characters, places, things, events, actions, and quality features. It is a bottom-up analysis. It formalizes multimodal semantic structures of these basic narrative elements. Um, it's multimodal because as we will see in the later uh, example, the methods track these elements across audio, visual, and textual modes. And we have also been uh, testing uh, an empirical ground of multimodal cohesion the recent publication, we combine eye tracking experiment with the cohesive analysis in film. So let's look at this example. Um, it's a um, built TV news report on 25th of February. That's the second date of the Ukraine war. And I will show the first minute of it. The report is in German, but you can still clearly see the multimodal constellation of it. Um, it starts with this anchor person at the left side introducing um, the on the site correspondent in Kiev. The anchor first tells the audience that um, their correspondent spent a night in the bunker and then the correspondent then takes over to report the situation. Also, wir gehen zu Peter Hell nach äh, Kiew, äh, der dort den ganzen Morgen unterwegs ist. Äh, wir haben um 5 Uhr das erste Mal mit ihm gesprochen heute Morgen. Da war er in einem Luftschutzbunker, hat dort stundenlang ausgeharrt mit vielen anderen, mit Zivilisten, steht jetzt ähm, auf der Straße in Kiew. Äh, Peter, was kannst du berichten? Wie ist die Situation? Und denk dran, das Mikro nah an den Mund zu halten, damit man dich gut verstehen kann. <lacht> Okay, ich glaube, jetzt, jetzt müsste es eigentlich funktionieren, wenn meine Stimme noch funktioniert. Ähm, also die Situation ist im Moment etwas ruhiger geworden. Wir haben hinter mir, das ist der Südwesten, äh, aus der Stadt raus. Okay, so it's in German, but it 
it doesn't matter. Um, you can still feel the multimodal constellation and combination of the elements here. So the cohesion analysis deals with tracking dominant narrative elements cross modally So here's an example. The first most dominant elements uh, that we see is these two anchor persons. They are realized in the mode of a talking head. So this is their show. So they um, talk almost throughout the show. And um, um, then we can see the second uh, most dominant um, who could say a uh, character is some lay persons, um, such as this close up image of this um, victim in the middle. And um, in the split screen on the right side, we could uh, see constantly these uh, civilians um, going into the car um, and trying to flee Kiev. And we can see these uh, lay persons in the um, split screen. And um, we also have um, the, the term civilians, so civilisten are spoken in the dialogue, in, in, the, in the verbal text by the anchor person. So these arrows link together cross um the um, elements that belong to the same semantic category. So we have here the anaphoric relations uh, binding together um, uh, narrative elements in different modes, but belong to the same um, semantic category. And then we have putting very dominantly in the middle of the caption and also on the bottom part. So there are two elements in written text linking together. We have Ukraine, also the location seen in the caption in written text and also in the split screen on the right side with um, uh, it's uh, like a civilian camera um, filming the central place of Kiev all the time. And then we have the term war uh, written in the middle of the screen. And then also bloody, that is the quality description of the war, written also very dominantly in the middle, uh, blue tick click, bloody war, re uh, written in it, um, in the caption. So this is a multimodal cohesive chains that um, can be extended further throughout the entire film or news report. It shows how these narrative elements are realized multimodally. So continue the second image when the um, uh, correspondent takes over you can see reporter's um, chain is also established. It was um, referred to as Peter Hay, that is his name, by the anchor person, and he started to talk. And you can see the arrows link these elements together. These are all multimodal elements linking together under the semantic category of reporter. You can see that um, he referred himself as mine and Mia, and then in the end, his name is also written in the caption. So, um, and um, in the second image, you can see that um, the location chain Ukraine is also extended and the war and bloody, um, this chain, two chains are also extended by the synonym or hyponym of Schwerkampf. So Schwerkampf, heavy fights, um, belong to the same semantic category, like a bloody war or violent conflicts. So they are all linked together under the same chain. So you can see the complex um, multimodal cohesive chain here. As I just said, these chains could go on and on, and we can see how these elements are realized cross modally how they link, to, how the chains link together um, multimodal elements within the same semantic category. So for our pilot study, um, we analyze individualization strategies by using nine features within the cohesive chains. That is. We look at, we look for lay persons in a cohesive chain, whether we can find lay persons, whether we can find a talk, or we find um, whether they are a specific pr protagonist in cohesive chain. And here, um, be because in these three months, Putin is always um, the protagonist. So we give uh, Putin a special um, category here to track. And we also track whether there is a specific mode, close up images of lay person and protagonist. And like TV, um, very often put Putin like this in the extremely close shop for creating, um, creating some scary effect. This uh, kind of a close up of uh, Putin very often show up in big TV. And uh, we also track whether reporters com or commentators self reference um, can be found in the chain because this could indicate that the news report um, would um, communicate more personal uh, opinions rather than uh, more objective facts. So we take this as a um, decisive uh, mechanism as well for individualization strategy. 
apart from these individual features, we also track these um, typical news sensationalist features like the event of war, violence, conflict, danger, whether we can find them in the cohesive chains and whether we can find negative evaluation. Like here, um, war is not just war, it's a bloody war, it's a brutish creek. Um, and also we try to look for whether we can find emotional descriptions also in the cohesive chain. And finally, we uh, also want to examine whether wallpapering, this strategy is also accompanied by um, individualization strategies in different channels. So wallpapering is a decorative editing, kind of decorative editing strategies in news report that dumped, they just dumped the images or videos that are not directly related to the report. So you can see Beautiful use a lot of split screens and just fill the background with all these different kinds of videos and images that are not necessarily uh, related to what they are talking about. And again, um, we um, coded these nine images, um, nine features in the first report of these 160 videos from the two news channels. And the first report um, is the top news stories and it lasts around three minutes. So we coded these nine uh, features and see whether it applies or not applied in the first, um, uh, in the first uh, uh, news topic. So this is the first result. Um, we can see the frequencies of these nine categories. Um, uh, if we see the lay person's interview, the first three one lay persons, protagonists, and close up, we can see that um, actually Tucker shall use more dominantly than Beard. So Tucker shall use um, a lot of lay person's interview, protagonists, and close up of them to tell news stories. And um, build also, but not so dominantly used like Tagashao. But the rest of the category, like self-reference, putting violence, conflict, negative evaluation, emotional reaction, and wallpapering, um, build TV used them dominantly, uh, while Tagashao uh, tried to minimize them. You can see in the table of self-reference, Tagashao only did it once, while build TV used 46% uh, of the video. And um, they are always self-reference of personal opinions. And if you see putting uh, Bill TV um, in Bill TV, 64% of their video have putting mentioned, but Tagashaw has only uh, 70, uh, 27% of the old video. They, they don't particularly focus on putting. So um, from this result, we can see that Bill TV uses individualization with emotion, negative uh, evaluation, and reporter severance or papering all together. They combine these elements together. In Tagashaw, there is also strongly individualization strategy, but Tagashaw minimizes all these other features. Um, apart from frequencies, we also use um, PCA analysis, uh, principal component analysis, to look at how the nine variables cover the same or different kinds of variation of data. So you can see from the two graphs, um, the left side, Tagashaw, right side, the TV. You can see that um, these two graphs indeed ex exhibit very different way of how data points are clustered. Um, the most obvious one is probably layperson and protagonist in Tagashaw. These two are almost in opposite directions, while in Bill TV, <clears throat> they are close together. So um, Tagashaw kind of distinguish two um, subtype of individualization is more protagonist oriented and layperson oriented reports, while Bill TV mixes the two. Another um, um, obvious difference is the putting. So you can see that in the built TV graph on the right side, putting is bundled together very closely to conflict. And while Tagashaw is rather independent. So in built TV, uh, individualizes the war as specifically Putin's personal war, but Tagashaw doesn't really refer the war as Putin's individual uh, war. So um, to conclude, in this pilot study, we compare narrative strategies of individualization um, of um, between online news videos and the public news video target show. We investigate nine features from cohesive chains of news videos and found it that both target show and Bill TV strongly use individualization strategy, but in very different ways. 
So our analysis is, um, can explicitly distinguish between strategies in online and public news videos. And our next step, to also our next um, task in our project is to combine this analysis with uh, computer uh, methods. So how can we automatically detect these strategies? So uh, we can see that Bio TV combine uh, self-reference and um, emotional description, negative evaluation, wallpapering. If we could automatically detect the combination of those, we have the automatic detection of a fake narrative pattern of individualization. And um, apart from individualization in our project, we are also looking for more narrative strategies uh, for automatically um, detection. Um, uh, for automatically distinguish online and public news outlets, for example, um, narrative strategies of emotionalization or dramatization. You can see a uh, different kind of uh, dramatic structures, even similar to Hollywood films being employed in uh, online news videos. So these are all the future di directions we'll be working on. Thank you. And thank you a lot, Xiaoyi. Uh, this was a great talk. Um, I will open the floor. We have some time for questions. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, maybe I can start with one obvious question is it's like imagine like for the future work, right? So we will do this with the computer vision and NLP methods. We will detect certain things there. Can we, when we detect these narrative patterns, can we like surely say that if certain media company uses such strategies, they are kind of, let's say, dis disseminating wrong information or disseminating information to persuade or whatever their agenda could be. Like, can we surely say this, uh, this outcome basically? I think um, the wrong information a bit, uh, is a bit too strong, but we could say that they are using um, risky strategies. They are using narrative strategies that um, risk manipulation. And I think um, we are able to um, formalize uh, the structure of these two different kinds of strategies. One is more manipulative kinds. One is more objective kinds, although they also try to use, as I said, individualization also, although they also try to use um, narrative or storytelling, but they try to maintain certain kind of objectivity, mm -hmm. while the other online news channels, they kind of take this to extreme for marketing purposes. And then I think um, one can distinguish them uh, in a formal way. Um, maybe then I can ask like a follow-up question on this. So at the moment from narrative strategies, as far as I understood, you're looking at how the content is uh, visualized, how is it uh, perceived, maybe not perceived, but how is it basically given to the listener or a viewer? But is it also like what is being uh, said? Is it also part of narrative strategy, like the actual content, whether this is not just about how you present, but also what you present? Is it also part of a narrative strategy or this is something else than what, what we see? Uh, what do you mean what you present? Because what so, I track and like uh, putting, for example, is already the content. Yeah, yeah, but here it's, but they put the put in as a close up. Obviously, it's about in intensifying the message and so on, but we don't focus on the message. We don't, we're not looking at what are they saying. We're just looking at how are they saying it. Mm -hmm. So, in uh, misinformation, it's not just about how, but also what you're saying is also important. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I think uh, what I just show is not just. Um, how they are presented it's also what they are presented for example some um like tiger show i, I compare tiger show and uh, bill tv bill tv use a lot of war as the topic so and tiger show doesn't necessarily before the ukraine war um started they reported not so much about the war but uh, bill tv just focus on war 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 every day um first they report a kazakhstan war and then war in the COVID demonstration and a war here and there they like to use the violent conflict or everywhere but tiger shall only um talk about war after that um uh, we can break up so this is also already uh, what is being talked about yeah mm -hmm. so it's a kind of combination of um individualizing strategy is 
what is inside and how it is presented to the combination, then it becomes the more high level description of uh, individualization strategy. Yes, yeah, I, sorry, I also missed the part where the, the person was talking about himself, like me, my experience, yeah, and so yeah. on. Yeah, so it's also like I, the, the Bill TV talk a lot about mm -hmm. themselves. Um, and well, Tagashaw never does that. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah, thank you very much. So we are quite on time now to move on with the next uh, talk. Thank you again, Jiawi. Thank you. So our next talk would be by Mesut Erhan Unal. And he will be presenting a paper called Visual Persuasion in COVID-19 Social Media Content and Multimodal Characterization. Mesut, could you please share your screen? Yeah, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, we can, but not okay. your slides yet. Yeah, okay. Um, so you okay. should be able to see it now. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you so much for the workshop. Um, and hi, everyone. My name is Erhan, and I will be presenting our work um, titled Visual Persuasion in COVID-19 Social Media Content uh, and Multimodal characterization. So this is the agenda for today's presentation. So we will kick off with, with a brief introduction and research questions. Then I will introduce our approach and the experiments we perform to answer our research questions with empirical evidence. And lastly, I will conclude my talk with a Q&A. Um, today, multimodal content is everywhere and social media is no different. Um, people use multimodal, multiple modalities to convey information and shape meanings and interpretations toward uh, desirable implications. However, however uh, the choices and impacts of using both text and visual image images have not been sufficiently studied. In our work, we propose a computational approach to analyze the impacts of persuasive multimodal content on popular reliability and reliability within the now, novel domain of COVID-19. And our work demonstrates how to use multimodal analysis This is to understand influential content. So these are the research questions we would like to investigate. Um, to what extent do textual and visual signals in a tweet predict the popular data and reliability of news articles shared on Twitter? What textual and visual elements are predictive of the popular data and reliability of shared news? And how can we identify the predictive signals? How does combination of textual and visual elements in unreliable and reliable sources differ? Our approach, uh, first the data set. So we construct a new data set for our analysis as there was no, there was not a large enough uh, multi-model data set for articles shared on social media. Um, our data set is constructed on top of a list of pandemic related tweets curated by Chen et al. Uh, and re reliable native coding of news domains by Greenberg et al. Um, in their work, they use red, orange, yellow, and green to denote the tendency of new sources to uh, elicit fake news and misinformation, what, um, red being the highest and green being the lowest, and such here to denote self-describing such critical sources. Um, after ret ret retrieving tweets, we merge them by article 
uh, they shared and obtain a set of articles and each of which consists of article image article title and user generated tweet text sharing the article. Um, the first task we want to perform is article popular classification. Um, to label our articles based on popular data, we come up with a measure that makes use of raw popular data and audit in size. So we basically sum up the engagement of tweets sharing an article and normalize it by audience size. We label top 20% of the articles as popular and the bottom 20% as unpopular. Um, all of the popular articles in our data set have a popular measure P bigger than zero. And all of the unpopular articles have exact zero popularity measure. So the second task we want to perform is article reliability classification. In our work, uh, I would like to say that in our, in our work, reliability is is attributed to the news source, uh, not the article itself. Um, so after re 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 reviewing Gutenberg et et al's uh, labeling strategy, we strip yellow and satire sources out as they cannot be perfectly associated with channeling misinformation. Um, we consider articles for, for from green sources as reliable and articles from either red or orange sources as unreliable. So our multi-model classification model consists of a visual backbone that encodes the image and a textual backbone which consists of two separate text CNNs uh, to encode tweet text and article title. As tweet text, we use the concatenation of top five user-generated tweet text sh sh sharing the article uh, based on the engagement statistics. Um, lastly, we concatenate representations from two backbones and perform our tasks of interest. To investigate the difference in multimodal content creation strategies between reliable and unreliable sources, we learn a giant joint embedding space uh, in which image and text of the same article resides closer. Um, and one advantage of performing these two tasks using the same feature representation is that one can investigate important parts of the inputs for each task and each label. So we use a we use red cam for visualize vis, visualization, but combine it with smooth grid to smooth and out the grid the end information, basically. Um, as for the experiments, the first one uh, is to verify effectiveness of uh, of our class of services certification model and we test our model against several multi-model baselines including two state-of-the-art approaches um, our, and our approach outperforms all of the baselines we considered and even though these two tasks um, seem orthogonal uh, optimizing them at the same time gives better results and to investigate which model the data is useful for our tasks of interest. We train the single task version of our model with different input types. And we see that the bit task texts carry the most useful signal for popular data, while all other while all input types contain useful signal for reliability. 
and hashtags and mentions do not have a drastic effect on the signal that the tweet text carry towards popular classification. And, have, and have, having visualized important regions for each tasks, each task and label, uh, we found that national symbols, charts, comics, pipettes, needles, and large text on the images were as, as, were, were associated with an article com, 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 coming from an unreli unreliable source. And within the article titles, uh, sentence fragments that can be associated with Revelation, conspiracy, decline in economic activity, uh, or ridiculing or portraying COVID-19 as a hoax uh, were associated with unreliability too. To investigate if there is, if there is any dif difference in the multimodal content creation strategies of reliable and unreliable sources, we learned a, jo a joint embedding space on one domain and test if it generalizes onto the other one. Um, and how unreliable sources creates multimodal content does not really generalize well onto reliable sources. Um, and this difference is not because unreliable content is more homo homo homogeneous. Uh, comparing their data distributions with maximum mean discrepancy, we found that article images are more homogeneous within reliable sources, and that there is no significant difference in homo homo homogeneity between reliable and unreliable article titles and tweet texts. So as for the conclusion, we examined the elements of multimodal information and misinformation on social media. Uh, we showed that the popular, popular reality and reliability of an article can be inferred with good accuracy using visual and textual content alone. Uh, without relying on expensive network or use other features. Uh, we measured the impact of the visual and textual signals, as well as which segments within them most contribute to the persuasive power of the articles. Uh, we showed unreliable articles use multimodal associations very differently to, cons to construct the uh, read, to construct their rhetoric, and our, and our, and our work is is a step towards on further understanding misinformation, misinformative COVID nineteen related content circulating on social media, and I would like to thank for thank you for your attention, and I I. I, 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 and I also would like to thank NSF and Air Force Office of Scientific Research for their grant on our work. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Arhan. Um, thank you a lot for your talk. Uh, we have um, almost reached our time for the break. So we have one or two minutes for questions, if anyone has in the audience. Yeah, Gulab. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. 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 So thank you for your talk, uh, Ronald. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, I looked at uh, uh, the diagram of the model. Uh, I just wanted to ask, did you keep the model really simple, like uh, using the word to back and the com layers and a simple concatenation method just to see the, uh, the uh, relation between the inputs and the outputs or uh, prediction variables? Uh, is that the reason you could not use yes. uh, a complex pipeline for multimodal? Yes, 
actually that is the reason so we wanted to keep the model as simple as possible but we also tested some more complex models and we have seen that there they didn't really improve the results on this con this context so for example we use um bird and bearings um and we also try to model encode text with uh with a um recurrent network for example uh but they didn't improve the result and what about uh, using this uh, uh different like a uh, co-attention mechanism for fusion rather than just concatenation did you try that also i see uh yeah so so we actually we didn't but one of our baselines uses that so that okay. um um Bielski and Trzynski, i i am sorry for okay yeah second i don't know how to read that name but yeah the, their approach use this co co attention and and mm -hmm. we have seen that uh, 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 uh we have seen that the simple model as ours uh, perform really better than than mm -hmm. that one okay okay thank you for answering yep thank you right thank you um i don't see any other questions so Thank you, Erhan. Uh, with this, we reach basically our first break. Uh, so we'll have a break till 45, depending on your time zone, whatever the hour is. So we'll have a 30 minutes break. So we'll be back with our second invited talk. Thank you so much. Welcome to the second uh, session of our workshop. So for our second invited talk, uh, I'm going to invite Christian Otto who is my colleague and a doctoral researcher here at PIB uh, Visual Analytics. And his research topic is examining cross-modal interrelations between uh, visual and textual information. And today the topic of his talk is uh, characterization and classification of semantic image, image and text relations. So I'll invite uh, Christian and the floor is all yours. You can start and uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you for the invitation and I'm happy to be here. Uh, and yeah, as Kulad said, uh, today I wanna to talk to you about the characterization and classification of semantic image text relations, which is part of my PhD thesis. And yeah, let's get started. So the question we are uh, trying to answer here is, um, how can we describe and measure the interrelations between a text and an associated image on an in a analytical level? So um, what does that mean? Um, I think most of you are familiar with the typical um, image caption, image text pair that you can see in data sets like MS Coco, where you have a very um, straightforward description of the image contents and you can relate stuff that you can see with actual words uh, in the text. Here, you, for example, um, uh, yeah, an image on the left. And uh, but uh, and um, there is a publication from 2017 published by our group that tried to um, formalize this uh, relation uh, and they called it uh, cross-model mutual information. So yeah, this is a measure you can imagine it, um, if you want to measure it, um, it's from 0% overlap of image and textual entities up to 100%. So this is rather straightforward. But as you can also imagine, this is uh, not the entire truth. So there is more to the interrelation between image and text. And there are samples um, that you can find that are a little bit more sophisticated, like the, this example here, you have uh, a shoe uh, and also a text that says gravity will never be the same. So, and without some basic uh, level of intelligence and also um, contextual knowledge, um, it would be hard to relate these um, words with the image. And this um, connection between the modalities they described in this publication as a semantic correlation. And this measure is a little bit more intricate and it um, has three dimensions basically that um, are either so they can be positively related the image and the text as you can see in this example they can be uncorrelated which is also uh, intuitive but um, they can also be 
contradictory. And that means that um, the co-occurrence of an image and the text um, is contradicting each other. And um, the comprehension is a little bit disturbed. That means uh, this is the case if a text refers to an object in an image, um, which cannot either, either either not be found or it has a different attribute um, describing it. And an observer might ask himself the question, so uh, what is going on here? Uh, do the image and text not belong together or were they placed by mistake, for example? So this is something that is rare, but it happens. Okay, yeah, and this is what they, uh, what this is the foundation for wh when I started my work, um, these two metrics. And then, um, I wanted to dig deeper into this and I was, uh, but I was thinking to myself, um, so we cannot be the first to think of capturing these relations and metrics, right? And yeah, as it turns out, <laughs> not that's not the case. Um, so there's this thing called the visual verbal divide, which has been investigated uh, for many decades in uh, not computer science, but mainly in communication and media science. And uh, yeah, they are approaching things a little bit def uh, differently, so to speak. Um, so these relations are often captured in so-called image text classes rather than metrics. And there are a lot of proposals. So different taxonomies, categorizations, and I started digging through all of them uh, or most of them, I guess. Um, and yeah, as I found out, they suggest as you can imagine, useful distinctions between different ways how image and text can convey information um, and characterizations. And as it uh, as was pretty clear, they implicitly considered these two metrics I just introduced to you, but not uh, yeah, um, to uh, um, to in a way that I liked so much, because yeah, there there were some drawbacks to these existing works. Um, most importantly, most of them were neglecting this negative way that the semantic correlation uh, can uh, happen. And I guess you could argue that, yeah, okay, image and text were, um, there, was a, there was a mistake, maybe this was not on purpose, but um, I thought it is not right to just it was since it was not intentional you cannot neglect this way or this dimension of the of the metric because it can still happen and wouldn't it be nice to be able to identify uh, image text samples where there is errors or maybe inconsistencies uh, just uh, going back to the fake narratives for example maybe it would be nice to detect if something is off <laughs> um, in other categorizations you can find that uh, they were tailored to certain applications for example, here uh, illustrated books, but um, I didn't like that too much because uh, yeah, I wanted a general way to approach this image text problem and not tailor to a specific application. Um, and the third problem was a, that a lot of uh, taxonomies were rather subjective. That means it was not possible to assign an image text class to one certain class. You always had the problem, now is it does it belong to this class or this class or maybe even both? And some of the taxonomies even allowed it. And this was something that is just uh, impractical in my opinion. So what did I learn from this research? Um, as I said, the two metrics are already hidden and in these existing image text classes. Um, and what also was pretty clear pretty quickly is that we lack at least one metric. Um, and this is called the status relation. Uh, and this was introduced uh, in 1977 by Barthes, which simply answers the question, are image and text equally important to convey the information of the image text pair? And uh, the answer to this question has three possible uh, dimensions, either yes, they are equally important or they are unequal. And if that's the case, either the text or the image is more um, important to convey the overall message of the image text pair. Yeah, for example, here in this uh, example, you see uh, the defini definition of a turnbuckle, what, it, what its components are, how it works, um, how it looks like. And at the bottom, you can see just an example image, but um, the overall message uh, is, in, is in the text and you could either dismiss the image entirely because it is pretty much all in the text, or you could just replace this with, with something different. Um, it is replaceable. Okay. And with this research, I defined my goals. What, I, what did I want to achieve uh, with uh, this work that I'm presenting? Um, I wanted an unambiguous categorization of image text classes based on these three metrics. 
I wanted to definitely uh, relate all of this to communication scientists, be, uh, science, because yeah, I am. Um, they, these people put decades of work into this. Uh, them, I, it would be good to base uh, some stuff on on what they did in order to make it more, um, I guess, uh, valid. Then I wanted uh, some kind of evidence to see that my taxonomy is uh, is correct and intuitive, and yeah. Since we are from machine learning, I also also wanted to see whether these uh, image text classes and metrics could be um, automatically classified. Um, yeah, and for this I needed a data set which could be, which I don't want, didn't want to manually gather because yeah, this is a tedious process. Um, but first of all, I had to uh, actually create the image text categorization. So as I said, I had three. I had the three um, metrics, two from the already existing paper and the status relation, which yielded in theory 18 possible combinations of classes if I just combined them. Um, and I looked at each individual one and asked myself, do they all make sense? Well, it turns out no. Uh, the justifications for that uh, would take a little bit too long now, so I just gonna skip them. But the remaining eight form a categorization, which you can see uh, on the next slide, it looks like this. And yeah, each combination of the three metrics uh, form a certain image text class. And which, uh, and the nice thing is uh, five of these eight, so the, uh, these three, and these two at the bottom are already established in communication science. And these three you can see here, which are the negative counterparts to these here, um, where, as I said, I, I, I wanted to consider the negative semantic correlation were new in this uh, categorization. Yeah, and this uh, was, the, was, the, was the theoretical basics. And now to the machine learning part, of the of the work, um, when it comes to the data set acquisition of the uh, positive semantic correlation, I won't go into detail due to uh, the time constraints. It was not straightforward, but uh, but it was possible. I utilized many different data sets in order to uh, generate the different classes that uh, you uh, just saw in the categorization. But maybe we can briefly talk about how I achieved. Um, to get some data for the for the negative semantic correlation uh, samples, because as you can imagine, um, there is no abundance of uh, fault faulty uh, image text classes with certain errors in the in in the internet, or there is no data set for this. Um, and the important part here is that you can't just uh, pick something uncorrelated, it's still, there, there needs to be a connection between the image and the text, but there needs to be some few errors in there. And what I uh, did in order to get these samples is I used their, um, then their, 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 their positive counterparts. So that these, the, the, the fact that these two groups of classes are related, the top ones and the bottom ones here. Um, so for example, you can see a positive example here on the left. And what I did is I created a list of 530 antonyms and opposites and also a color randomizer and went over all these texts and replaced certain words that were replaceable, in my opinion. Uh, nowadays, there are more sophisticated ways to, to do this um, falsification, but this is what I did um, three years ago. Um, yeah, and so you can see that I created a negative example from this positive one by switching these words around. Suddenly, the people were wearing red costumes or purple hats, for example. Um, and this is clearly off when you see the image, but still the image is after uh, text is still connected to this image. As you can see, there are still people talking on their phones. Uh, she's walking with her brother and yeah, funky hats. <laughs> so, uh, and this approach yielded me a total of 224,000 and some image text pairs for um, the deep learning approach that I want to show you next. Ah, yeah, first of all, we also, um, in order to validate the, this data acquisition process, we did a manual labeling a study with three annotators and achieved an intercoder agreement of um, 0.847, according to Krippendorf's alpha, which is pretty decent. Yeah, and then uh, we attempted to 
uh, classify these metrics and classes with a pretty straightforward uh, multimodal embedding. Uh, so there was a, a feature, uh, in, an image encoding with an inception ResNet, a bidirectional GRU um, system for the texts, an attention mechanism, and after concatenating the features, we fed them through four classification layers in order to uh, it, it get our outputs. And the results of this you can see here. Surprisingly, this worked very well. Uh, we achieved an accuracy of uh, 80% or even almost 81%. Um, and the most obvious um, struggles the, the system had were detecting uncorrelated classes. Uh, so you could say that the system still picked up some connections. Uh, and positive and negative uh, counterparts were switched up with each other, which is understandable since image and text are basically the same just for this few keywords turned around. Yeah, and the conclusion of this is uh, for this paper, we introduced this new metric. We derived an image text categorization of eight semantic and computable image text classes and showed that this they can be um, predicted with um, deep learning classifier. We also published this data set if you are interested um, yeah, under this reference here. And maybe for um, a final thoughts, uh, the further avenues in this direction, which are, we are currently working on is um, extending this, uh, this categorization. Gulal is also working on that. <laughs> uh, but what uh, some work I did is um, I tried to predict the relative abstractness level of image and text, which um, was also, also something where we got indications from the existing uh, research that this is something that is hidden in the, um, in the categorizations of communication scientists. Uh, then we are trying to reintroduce this spectrum of metrics where, where which is, yeah, it is intuitive, but it is harder to, um, to, do, to do on point since, uh, for, exam, um, for example, the semantic correlation is a rather subjective task to determine, is it uh, a very high semantic correlation or rather low? And how many levels, intermediate levels are you going to um, uh, assume? So this is something we are working on. And lastly, we are also trying to introduce uh, real world um, context information or measuring entity consistency by verifying people, locations, and events. Since the original system, um, every every person or every human it sees is a is a human or a person or a woman or a man. But uh, as soon as real names are in the text, it can't really distinguish between um, uh, correct and wrong. Yeah. So to summarize, uh, we try to answer four questions when it comes to the connection or the relation between images and text. And that is, what is the amount of shared concepts and entities? Um, are the depicted information contradictory, uncorrelated, or do they complement each other? Are image and text equally important to convey the information? And are the concepts and entities shown on the same level of abstraction? And that concludes uh, my talk. Thank you. So, thank you for the interesting talk. So, any questions uh, for the speaker? Maybe I can start. Um, sure. Thanks, Christian, again. I mean, I know your work, obviously. <clears throat> I just wanted to ask you about this. You, you mentioned the techniques you used for negative correlation back then were what you used. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to ask you, do you have any other ideas on so on how to use this current uh, let's say i don't know are the state of the art methods like clip and so on how this could be leveraged to create this negative samples in some automatic way maybe or semi-automatic way to some extent maybe you, if you could say one well, something about it um yeah so uh, now i I, I, oh. I know the references, the current uh, state of the art. I think uh, even Gulal could help me there. Um, but there are ways of uh, doing this, uh, this falsification process more intricate that um, 
kind of depends on what the type of uh, shown information is. For example, um, if you find um, number words in the text, you can uh, detect them and randomize them. If, a, if, an, if, a, if an image caption says there are three people standing in front of the Eiffel Tower, you can uh, detect the, the three and jumble it around. And maybe you put a five or a seven there. It, that would make uh, a small, uh, introduce a small error or um, you could uh, detect certain images, maybe through instant segmentation or something and remove it by, and so uh, introducing a small error. Um, this is what I can think of from the top of my head, but certainly, um, yeah, the, there are other uh, options there. <laughs> All right, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so it looks like they're not, we can move ahead. So the next is uh, our back to paper presentations, except the paper presentations. So the first one or the second one today is by uh, Shivangi Singhu and her paper title is Leveraging Intra and Intermodality Relationship for Multimodal Fake News Detection. So you can go ahead and start. Is my screen visible? Uh, yes, it is. Yeah. So hi, everyone. And um, good evening to all of you. So I'm Shivangi Singhal. I'm a PhD student at IIIT Delhi, India. And today on behalf of my team, I'm here to present our work, leveraging intra and intermodality relationship for multimodal fake news detection. Recent years have uh, witnessed a massive growth in dissemination of fake news online. And we know that uh, you know, user-generated content is generally a blend of text and visual information, which can lead to production of different variants of fake news also. So one such example is shown on the screen right now. This tweet read as follows. A husband divided his assets in half while settling divorce case with her ex-wife. Now, if you read the text part only, it might look believable to you. But when you read that same piece of information with an image, like one which is shown on the screen, we might question the credibility of news. The image shows objects like laptop and the car, which is cut into halves. We evaluate stories authenticity by analyzing the information which is generally present in different modalities, which is associated with the news piece. The image here in this example proved to be a stronger signal than text to verify the authenticity. Now, a modality is strong when it can assign a high probability to the correct class. And a higher probability implies that a more informative signal and a more stronger confidence towards the prediction. If you consider the existing methods for multimodal fake news detection, they do not work on this principle of weak and strong modality. <clears throat> Instead, methods you know, generally capture high-level information from different modalities and then jointly model them to determine the authenticity of news. The feature extraction also occurs globally, ignoring the salient pixels which contain meaningful information. For example, if you see in the figure, uh, the blue portion and the red portion highlights the essential segments of the image and text, respectively. Current methods of extracting this visual features include background information also that might be unwanted. And similarly for text, it's important for us to you know, extract the context dependencies which are present between the text features. So in this paper, we hypothesize that not all modalities play an equal role in decision-making process on a particular sample. So therefore we aim to design an architecture that utilizes a multiplicative multimodal method which will capture the intermodality relationship. The method suppresses the cost from the weak modality by introducing a downweight factor in the cross entropy loss function, which we will discuss later. And the downweight factor associated with each modality highlights the prediction power of the remaining modalities. So if 
I can say that if other modalities has higher confidence in predicting the correct class, cost associated with the current modality will be suppressed and vice versa. And second, we also capture the intramodality relationship. The idea is to generate fragments for a modality and then learn fine grain, you know, representations from these fragments. So specifically, our aim is to answer three research questions, which is currently shown on the screen. But before moving to that, let's quickly revisit the existing multimodal approaches, which is there and presented by the research community. So multimodal fusion with RNNs for humor detection was the first attempt towards multimodal fake news detection. It comprises of three modules. The first certain network uses RNN to combine the text and the social context features. The second uh, sub-network is VG, uh, VGG19, which is uh, pre-trained on the ImageNet database. And the third sub-network is a neural network, uh, neural level attention module that uses uh, the output of RNN to align the visual features. Then we have TICN, which was an attempt done by Yang and the team. The method extract latent text and image features, represent them in a unified feature space, and then use these learned features to identify fake news. Another study by Wang proposed an event adversarial neural network for fake news detection. The core idea was to design a method that learns even invariant features and then preserve the shared features among all the events for fake news detection. Qatar also came up with MVAE, which was multimodal variational autoencoder for fake news detection, where the core aim was to generate shared representations for the features, which was learned from the modalities. It had three submodules, encoder, decoder, and a fake news detector. Now, recently, transformer-based language models have shown significant performance over these traditional machine learning-based methods. So Singal and the team came up with SpotFake and SpotFake Plus that leverages text information from BERT and ExcelNet respectively, and image features were again came from VGG19 pre-trained network. And similarly, if you see, most of the works that we have mentioned right now didn't make use of any relationship capturing between the text and the image. So Zhao came up with this method called SAFE, which was similarity aware multimodal fake news detection, where they leverage relationship between text and images. And then another study by Singal and the team came up with a method where they leverages the information from the text and multiple images associated with the image. Now, if you see all the related work, which is, you know, which we have presented right now, each of these method either you know, uh, has text component via text CNN or some of the networks. And for the images, they use VGG19 pre-trained network. The second limitation that we could, you know, think of was that complete image was passed through the network to generate the representations. And we believe that, you know, image might contain redundant information in the form of background, which can be excluded. So existing methods also combine these different modalities to form this multimodal feature vector which means that they assume that both modalities play an equal role in determining the veracity of the news. However, if we have seen you know, the growth of production of fake news over the years, we have witnessed a different version of fake news which is being produced over the years. So we believe that there is a need to design a method that captures intermodality relationship based on the modality which contributes towards fake news. So our proposed method consists of two modules, one which captures the intramodality relationship and the second one which captures the intermodality relationship. So if you see figure on the screen, the former gathers segment information from all the modalities independently. It derives global relationship among each of the fragment which is extracted for the modalities. And the latter is responsible for identifying strong and weak modalities via utilization of a multiplicative fusion method. So next we quickly just revisit each the component in detail. So the first network is text feature extractor. The text input is first, you know, represented as a sequence of word piece tokens, which is then passed through a transformer. We adopt BERT to perform the desired task. The continuous representations that confines all these learned information of the input is then passed through one uh, dimensional convolution neural network to capture the hidden uh, local context information. For extracting the image features, we primarily focused on extracting objects and other salient regions using a pre-trained detector. 
So given an image, we employ a bottom-up attention module, which was pre-trained on visual genome to extract this fixed set of image patches. And these image patches contain salient regions and represent the information which was useful in that case. Then the intermediate representations obtained from each of the fragment was passed through self-potential layer to capture the complex relation among these image patches. And finally, the obtained image embeddings were condensed into dense representations by performing average pooling followed by L2 normalization to get the final image feature vector. Next, our work aims to capture the interaction among different modalities to better perform the task at hand. So an intrinsic method would generally you know, combine complementary information to aggregate signals from different modalities and then design learning modules over these concatenated features. Such techniques are called as additive approaches and due to the type of aggregation operation performed. But there are some practical constraints in integrating you know, synergies across modalities using these additive approaches. Number one, additive methods assume that every modality is potentially helpful and is jointly combined to decide. Neural network which are built on top of these aggregated features cannot determine the quality of each modality and its contribution towards fake news detection task on a per sample basis. For example, if I say fact, uh, fake manipulations can be introduced by fabricating either text, image, or both the modalities. So given multiple input modalities, an ideal algorithm should be robust to noise from weak modalities and harvest relevant details from stronger modalities on a per sample basis. So in this work, we perform multimodal multiplicative method, which address this challenge. So if we say that every modality which is present in the new sample makes its own independent decisions and then additive combination would result in say loss of uh, which is a cross entropy loss which is mentioned in equation one now we introduce a downweight factor which is uh, equation two where beta is your hyperparameter to control the strength of this downweight so the downweight factor is responsible for suppressing the modalities predictive power that incorrectly classifies the sample. And the final loss function, the modified version of the cross entropy loss that came out while introducing this Q factor was the equation three. Now we quickly provide you the details of the data set that we use, the baseline models followed by detailed investigation on each of the questions. So we made use of two publicly available data sets to perform the task of multimodal fake news detection. One was Mireval benchmark data set, and the another one was Vibo data set. Then we used a bunch of uh, you know, state-of-the-art multimodal fake news detection algorithms, which are listed on the screen right now, that include unimodal models in the form of TechCNN and BERT, unimodal visual models in the form of VGG19. We had multimodal uh, fake news detection methods in the form of ENMB, spot fake. And then we have different versions of a proposed method also with which we compare our performance. So our first question is, is the proposed model able to improve multimodal fake news detection by leveraging this intra and intermodality relationship? Results indicate that our proposed method outperforms the baseline on the accuracy in F1 score for both the data sets. Spot fake was the strongest baseline for multimodal fake news detection and the proposed model outperforms by a fair margin of uh, 3.05 and 4.5 on accuracy and F1 respectively. The RQ2 aims to measure how effective the extracted fragments and self-attention representations are in improving the multimodal fake news detection. To answer the question, we compare proposed model with its different variants. On average, we encountered a drop of 1.8 and 2.7% on the accuracy in F1 respectively on removing the multiplicative uh, fusion module. So this shows the efficacy of you know, how, oh, the multiplicative method that we are using right now. To answer RQ3, we perform a qualitative analysis of the proposed method to validate its efficacy in identifying modality, which was you know, easily recognizing in falsification for particular new samples. For this, we took a random subset from the test set to examine the quality of the obtained Q score that we were looking into. And the case studies which are shown on the screen are some examples that, you know, which showed that which modality outshines in determining the falsicity. For example, if you see figure B, 
that was a classic case of fabricated content where content is created to deceive or to do harm so both text and image provide a strong confidence here in detecting the falsity and our model also you know showcase that or replicate that thing so downweight factor q which was assigned to text was 0.7 and to image was 0.4 respectively and if you see figure d which highlights a clear case of a doctored photo which was presented with you know genuine information to deceive the readers so this is a classic case of manipulated content which was identified by the uh, proposed model so to quickly conclude the paper presents a framework that leverages this intra and intermodality relationship we had two sub modules one which captures intramodality relationship via inclusion of bottom up attention modules for images and context representations for text and the second module was you know responsible for capturing the intermodality relationship which fuses you know features from different modalities in a multiplicative way and these are the list of people which we really want to thank that helped us in the project yeah that's all from our side thank you very much and the source code is also available uh, publicly available so please feel free to explore and contact any of us for any queries and if any further help you want in implementing these things thank you again thank you shivangi for the talk uh, we have time for just one question if someone has a question please ask yeah hi uh, i have a question can you hear me yes yes yeah, okay um so i was very impressed with the qualitative results uh, you showed on slide 24 um and since i was dealing with a similar problem i was wondering how uh, your system is able to pick up these um these inconsistencies um even though if i understood correctly um you you, uh, you didn't um feed them directly so everything it learns or all the the factual knowledge it has comes from your training samples right so what do you uh, my question would be i guess um uh, how do you think the system um decides on these uh, things like the example with the war zone uh, the, the third example you had on slide 24 when yeah. it comes to yeah interpretability yeah. yeah the core idea you know was when we have like different modules for fake news detection so we always you know focus on whether this was a real or fake the only core thing that we try to introduce here was to see that if you say something was fake or real which modality contributed towards it so we showed it with the help of say qualitative analysis but that is one of the future works that we want to see that you know the samples which were correctly predicted and the model was also saying that look in this particular sample the text was highlighting the most or image was highlighting the most we want to backtrack you know to the models and see that which part of the text or image was highlighted in deciding that factor because currently the model was trained end to end so it is also like you know a black box technique for us yeah. that what kind of you know highlights were there for example with bert we say that you know the highlight was uh, there will be specific sections of text that was highlighted with image we had different patches so we really want to go back and see you know what traces of images were useful what traces of text were picked up and since the results are proving that they are but uh, are doing the case is it so or not so something on the lines of you know robustness or checking whether the models that usually performs is the case also or is just you know some random thing which is going on in behind so that was also you know we were looking on that uh, how can we prove this to the you know researchers or audiences in future yeah i agree yeah thank you Okay, yeah, thank so you. thank you. Uh, I think we need to move to the second and uh, the next talk. Uh, so the next talk is uh, by Kohei O'Hara, and the topic uh, or the title of the paper is "Winter Image Narrative Generation with uh, Emotion Archway Transformer." So you can go ahead, Kohei. Uh, you can share the slides and start. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, so then let me share my screen.
Oh, wait a second. Yeah, I can see, I can see the screen. Okay, so I can. So then, hello, I'm Kohei Uehara from the University of Tokyo. And today I'd like to talk about a recent work about uh, Pinte, image narrative generation with emotion archive with a transformer. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Yusuke Mori, Yusuke Mikuta, and Tatsuya Harada. So, uh, sorry, Koei, sorry, sorry. To yeah. Uh, we can see your the... notes. Maybe you should. Oh, sorry. Yeah. The, the slideshow. Can you yep. see yeah, my screen works. presentation mode? Yeah, okay. yeah, it is. Okay, thank you. So, yeah. Our task is to generate uh, emotion and narrative uh narrative from an image so image narrative generation differs from descriptive, descriptive caption generation in several respects uh, first the length of the text to be generated is longer and second there are frequent references to emotions in the text for example uh, you can see references to emotions in the ex example narrative such as uh, this cat likes to sleep and he looks very content. Therefore, the model for this task must have the ability to generate long sentences and must be emotion aware. And I'll explain about the background of this research. So making computers understand and have creativity is an important challenge. So creative text, creative text, such as stories are used in many different fields, such as uh, entertainment or advertising, and the ability to generate them automatically is of great value. So automatic generation of creative text is expected to have a wide range of applications. And indeed, there have been several studies in this field, including the generation of stories from images and uh, poetry generation from one image. And um, sorry, regarding the importance of emotions in stories, uh, Kat Ponekut, a famous American novelist, pointed out that the emotion arc can be used to represent the structure of emotions in a story. Uh, in the field of information science, uh, it has been confirmed that emotion arcs can be used to better understand the stories. Therefore, we used emotion emotion arc to represent the structure of emotions in image narratives. And we, we used the insights of the existing vision and language models for narrative generation. In particular, a model was developed based on the UNITER model. Uh, it is a one or two stream large scale, much more transformer based model. So now, I introduced a proposed model, Vinte. So Vinte can generate narratives using information from images and the desired emotional structure, which is represented by emotion arc. Uh, in this study, the emotion arc is represented as a triplet of emotions for each of the three parts of the story, uh, the beginning and the body and the ending. For example, uh, if the story starts with a joyful emotion because, and then becomes fearful in the body part and becomes surprised at the end, the emotion arc is represented as uh, joy and fear and then surprise. So, and since an image narrative consists of five sentences, so we consider the first sentence as beginning and the middle three sentences as body and the last sentence as ending. So we use seven categories for the emotion based on Eggman's basic emotions. And to get the golden levels for the emotions of image narratives, we use bad based emotion classification model. And image features for input to the model were extracted using a faster RCNN, uh, as is often done in this field. 
Uh, to include positional information to image feature, we add the region coordinate as uh, position embedding. And the emotions of each part are represented as uh, word tokens and entered into the model. In addition, we use a special token uh, called emotion step token to uh, concatenate the emotion word tokens. And we used pre-trained United Word embeddings to convert the tokens of uh, convert the tokens to emotion embeddings. So now I'll explain the decoder by uh, that output text from the input information. We derived the decoder architecture from BAD, BRT, a transformer-based decoder model for text generation. We trained our model in a standard uh, teacher for sync training model. So from here, I'll describe our experiment. Uh, we used uh, image narrative data set uh, created by CNR, and uh, we used 5,398 uh, narratives for training and less for the validation. And we compared our method with several baselines, including an uh, existing method from CNR and TenseCap model, and uh, image only model, uh, which is same as our Pinta model, but do not use emotions as input. Also, we tested several average methods, which is only a single emotion as the input. And we use several evaluation metrics. First, we use blue and bad score, which are commonly used as the evaluation metrics for sentence generation. Besides, we use several metrics to measure the correctness of the emotion of the generated narratives. So begin accuracy and body accuracy and end accuracy are the metrics to evaluate the emotions for each part of the narratives. Uh, Sega accuracy and arc accuracy are the metrics to evaluate the entire agreement of the emotions of the generated narratives. And in seg accuracy, the percentage of agreement is evaluated, whereas in arc accuracy, the exact agreement is evaluated. Also, we conducted HIMA evaluation on Amazon Mechanical Star. We presented the two generated narratives to the workers and asked them to rate which one was better. Uh, the criteria we presented to the workers were those uh, about image consistency and emotion consistency. And about input setting, settings, uh, we compared normal settings and with changes settings uh, where the input emotion are contains changes in emotion. So from here, I will explain the results of the experiment. So first of all, Pinta is superior to conventional methods such as uh, DenseCap and CNR. In addition, Pinta uh, performed considerably better than the image only model. However, uh, when compared with models with a single emotion, the difference in scores become uh, smaller or comparison methods got slightly better. And in terms of the variation of the entire emotions, Vinta uh, performed uh, significantly better in uh, seek accuracy and arc accuracy. And Vinta scored the second best for each segment accuracy. And the model with the emotion input for each segment has the best score for each corresponding segment, but has much lower accuracy for the other segment. And here, I'll explain about the result of human evaluation. About the image consistency, uh, we can see much difference from the baselines, maybe because uh, all of the models use the same image encoding method. And in terms of emotion and consistency, I'd like to uh, focus on cases where there are any changes in the emotion arcs. In those cases, our model tends to score better than compared method 
uh, except for except for pinta body. Uh, this is maybe because uh, body segment has the largest fraction in the narrative, so human evaluators tend to give a good score if only body emotions is correct, uh, ignoring the other part. So this is some examples from our model. As you can see from those examples, a winter could generate different narratives from the same image, uh, depending on the input emotion arc. Uh, for example, in the response example, uh, if the input emotion for the body part is joy, then the generated narrative is, uh, he looks happy. However, if the input emotion for the body is sadness, then the generated narrative becomes, uh, he seems to be sad. So I'd like to summarize our work here. In this study, we tackled, uh, we tackled the task of generating image narratives by uh, a transformer-based emotional aware text generation model. A model showed uh, promising results in our experiments, and we have confirmed our method can control the content of narratives with emotional input. So that's all. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Kohei. Um, do we have any questions in the audience? I have, I have a question. So uh, thank you for the talk, Kohei. Uh, I want to ask, uh, you said that the decoder is uh, derived from BART. Does that mean that it's, it's pre-trained from BART or the, the both transformer and encoder are like trained from this data set only? Are they pre-trained? On something? Uh, we do not uh, use pre-trained weight from uh, BART. Uh, just we derive the architecture of BART. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Another question I would like to ask is, so it obviously I, I get the point that it generates uh, text based on a certain emotion that you predefine, like that you one can select. How does it compare to yeah. other image caption generation methods in terms of, let's say, accuracy of uh, basically correctness of the of the caption besides the emotion part? Did you also do this experiment? Uh, in terms of uh, comparison, comparison with uh, basic image capturing method, I think dense caption is uh, one with a uh, basic image capturing method. So this is some kind of such a variation. So basically, our method is uh, significant, significantly better than such method. Okay, so I think it's so your method is significantly better than theirs, or vice versa. Uh, significant, significantly better. Uh, yours is also better in terms of um, content as well. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So we can move to the next talk if there are no more questions. Okay, so thank you for listening. Um, yeah. Thank you for all participants. Thank you. Yeah. So our next talk is by Diego Garcia Olano. Uh, his uh, title for the paper is Improving and Diagnosing Knowledge Based Visual Question Answering Via Entity Enhanced Knowledge Injection. So, Diego, you can go ahead and start. Okay. Can you all see my screen? Yeah, we can. Great. Okay. Um, uh, my name is Diego Garcia Olano, and I'll be presenting my work with uh, Yasumasu Onye and Joydeep Ghosh at uh, the University of Texas titled Improving and Diagnosing Knowledge Diagnosing Knowledge Based Visual Question Answering via Entity Enhanced Knowledge Injection. Um, so in knowledge based VQA, um, a model must answer questions about an image that explicitly require external um, world knowledge. So here a system must know who Barack and Michelle Obama are in order to answer this question correctly. Um, so some motivations for this, which led to this work, include the insight that uh, VQA models are expensive to pre-train in general, requiring many image question pairs. And so how can we improve upon their performance during fine tuning without the need to, do re, uh, to redo pre-training? Um, 
there's been a quite a there's been quite a bit of research trying to understand if language models can be used as knowledge bases. So meaning whether they can be used to answer questions which require knowledge. Um, but there's been less work trying to understand if vision language models can be used in such a manner. Um, in this, uh, in Perner et al. at ACL 2020, uh, they showed improved performance on text, um, like on text only entity centric tasks by using a simple entity based knowledge injection technique into language models. And so in this work, I wanted to see if this injection technique would also work for VQA models uh, that were knowledge based. Um, and then finally, while there's a lot of interpretability research on single modality tasks, uh, I wanted to see how knowledge injection would affect bimodal explainability. Um, so I'll now give some background on like the Ebert method from the uh, efficient uh, yet effective entity uh, embeddings for BERT paper. Um, first, uh, Wikipedia to VEC um, from Yasumada, uh, from sorry, Yamada to, um, 2016. It embeds words and entities. Uh, so entities being Wikipedia URLs, essentially, into a common space such that, um, so given a vocabulary of words and uh, entities, it learns a, a lookup and vetting and function uh, that you see here. Um, so what the eBird authors do is they align uh, Wikipedia to VEC entity vectors with BERT's word piece vector space. And then they feed these aligned vectors uh, into BERT as if they came from BERT's native word piece, uh, word, uh, piece space. Uh, and this procedure allows eBERT to inject knowledge into uh, BERT without making any changes to the BERT uh, encoder itself uh, or do any additional pre-training. So it's only done during fine tuning. Um, so the, how they do this is they learn an unconstrained linear mapping W that just minimizes the squared L2 norm between um, Wikipedia uh, to VEC entity um, um, like, yeah, Wikipedia to VEC and BERT. Um, and then uh, as this W can be applied, th this like learned uh, mapping W can be applied to entities since Wikipedia to VEC uh, embeds both individual words and, and entities into the same space. So at inference time, uh, given an input string that has an entity A in it, the authors simply use uh, W to construct an Ebert, an Ebert uh, entity, uh, embedding for that entity A. And then what they do is they prepend uh, the eBERT vector of the entity A uh, to the BERT embedding of A uh, with a slash between them. So here you can see that Jean Marais um, is that pink eBERT entity, and then it's followed by a slash, and then the BERT representation of the word piece um, uh, vector for Jean Marais. Um, and then they just feed that enhanced uh, input representation, those embeddings into uh, like the bird encoder. Uh, and then they, you know, uh, and then do classification with that. And they show that this sort of knowledge injection during fine tuning gives improved uh, accuracy and robustness measures for Q and A, for um, question answering and other tasks. Um, so in this work, we analyze how entity-based knowledge injection via Ebert affects the performance of an existing uh, visual linguistic model, uh, Alexa Mert, uh, on the knowledge-based VQA tasks, both in terms of accuracy and explainability. Um, so we first learned uh, a mapping between 5.8 million, uh, Wiki like the 5.8 million Wikipedia entity embedding matrix uh, that's provided with uh, Wikipedia to VEC. Uh, to that of the pre-trained uh, Alexa Mert BERT space, right? So the language encoder here. Um, and then uh, our experiments show uh, task improvement over two data sets and this over two data sets that I'll talk about now. And this comes without the need for any additional um, costly pre-training, right? Like any redoing a pre-training of Alexa Mert. Um, and importantly, this work is complementary to state-of-the-art methods, which which, like, which leverage retrieval-based uh, methods to gather additional context, like Realm and things of the sort, to improve um, task performance. Um, so going forward, um, so uh, talking about our data sets, uh, the KVQA data set um, is a large, um, has a large amount of QA pairs compared with other VQA data sets, and, and it has explicit wiki supervision, which is pretty unique. Um, although now, one, yeah, anyways, uh, but in of um, the 18.8K 
decay entities that exist in this data set, so uh, wiki entities, um, many of them are rare. So only about 65% of them exist within the top million occurring uh, wiki entities. And only about 91% of them are found in uh, the Wikipedia to Beck entity matrix. So like 9% of them like occurred after or just don't occur in this, um, in the mapping that was learned before. And then the other data set is OKBQA, which is a data set more used for common sense reasoning tasks. Uh, so it's less entity centric, but uh, it's, it's good in that it has many human generated answers per question. Uh, and, and as such is more robust from a human eval perspective. Whereas the KBQA just has one answer per question. And so there can be disagreement or like wording is very important. Um, so neither of these data sets uh, has explicit spans like entity spans um, that delineate the existence of entities in these questions or uh, image captions. So uh, for both data sets, we construct entity spans. Um, in both cases, we uh, use a pre-trained name entity recognizer, so spacey in this context. Um, for the KVQA data set, we create a person-centric um, entity span set, so that's number three. Um, an entity span set, which is like very aggressive and does no filtering based on type, that's number four. And then a data set based on uh, string matching between entities provided in uh, the metadata for the questions of KDQA. So like it, um, and the question image cap caption text itself. So KDQA comes with this supervision of um, Wikipedia entities, uh, though many times like these entities listed don't appear in the text or there are entities in the text which do not appear in the metadata. So it's not entirely gold, but it's, 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 fair, it's, um, it's okay. And then, so for the OKBQA set, we again use Spacey and then some automated rules um, to learn uh, and, manu and then finally uh, manual human filtering to derive three entity sets uh, that go from noisy uh, to less noisy, essentially. Um, so in looking at results uh, for KVQA, we see that using eBird with entity spans from this KVQA meta um, entity span set gives us 2.5 points higher accuracy uh, compared with just using the question and image caption itself. So that 52.83 versus 50.25. Um, and so these spans, the KDQA meta ones are like closest to gold spans. Like, um, however, there's still room for improvement. And uh, I'm not showing it here for time, but in purple, like the multi-hop and multi-relationship questions uh, within KDQA are improved by six and five points respectively. So introducing these entity enriched, um, can, you know, concatenate, like, like these entity enriched embeddings uh, definitely helps those types of questions. And uh, the KDQA also has like the breakdown of question types. So you can do this sort of analysis. And then uh, the improvement for lower quality derived entity spans. So like our NER per and NER aggro uh, still give 0.5 uh, accuracy improvement without having to do anything um, any retraining. So during your fine tuning that you would do anyways, using this gives you some um, improvement. And in all cases, uh, more context could be gathered uh, via like, you know, these uh, retrieval me mechanisms on the tech side and eBird could be used on top of those. Um, looking at uh, OKVQA, overall, actually eBert on this data set uh, is much less, uh, has much less effect since the data has very few um, entities as a percentage. Uh, in its questions. And then I actually didn't use the image captions from Coco uh, in, in my uh, experiments here. So that would be for future work. Um, but um, in all of the, like, there is a negative example here where if you use, so in some, you know, using the, the more um, higher quality 4K, 2.5K um, uh, entity sets actually like, you know, improves performance, doesn't hurt you, but using too noisy of entity spans could hurt your performance. Um, and so to go into kind of the explainability results, table four here shows accuracy results for when our explanation methods find eBert enhanced entities to be in the top five most important tokens for an answer prediction. Um, and so here we can see that uh, for seven of the nine models, questions which include eBert, uh, in their top five uh, important tokens using um, this BMGAE 
uh, um, explainability technique provide better accuracy than those of the other uh, TRF method, which I explain more in the paper. Um, and so averaging over the, the, BM, uh, uh, the BMGAE models, we get 59.74% uh, accuracy on uh, these sorts of, on these uh, questions, uh, where if you compare that with what you would get without using that knowledge, it's a 51.0, 51% um, accuracy. So this finding suggests that when using either method, an entity appearing in the top five most important tokens allows for improved accuracy, which is in agreement with the perturbation testing results from uh, this prior work listed below, which is where I got the explanation techniques from. Um, and then finally, in this paper, we show some qualitative examples of what text tokens and image regions are judged to be um, important for predictions. Uh, here we give a question, we're given a question in which continent was this person, was a person in the image born, uh, along with the image caption, Civil War photograph of Nelson. Uh, so the correct answer is Europe and the gold entity, uh, Newt Nelson is provided. Uh, so using the question text alone, so an M1, uh, is, it's able to predict with low probability the correct answer of Europe. However, when you add the image caption in, like the Civil War photograph of Nelson, the, uh, the model M2 incorrectly predicts North America due to the word civil war in Nelson. And then finally, in this, um, the model which utilizes Ebert's fans from KDQA Meta predicts Europe correctly and shows Newt Nelson, uh, his Ebert representation as being one of the most important text facts there uh, for the final prediction. Um, and there's more examples of this, but I just wanted to highlight that this type of analysis could be done with um, using this sort of knowledge injection. Um, for entity-centric knowledge-based tasks. So in recap, uh, we analyzed how efficient entity-based uh, knowledge injection via Ebert during fine-tuning affects the performance of an existing uh, VQA model LX and MERT on the task of knowledge-based VQA in terms of accuracy and explainability. And we showed improved, substantial improved uh, accuracy on the entity-rich KDQA data sets without the need to do any costly uh, re-pre-training of LX and MERT. Uh, baseline model accuracy is never harmed by knowledge injection on KVQA and only once uh, for K OKVQA when that uh, entity span set uh, quality is very low. And then finally, uh, this work is complementary to uh, state of the art methods, which leverage retrieval based um, methods to um, uh, gather additional content to improve VKA performance, since our method can be used on top of that retrieved. Uh, context if there are entities presented. Um, and with that, I conclude and thanks for listening. And uh, yeah, the code and preprint are available at the following links. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Diego, for the talk. Uh, thank you. Does anyone have questions? Uh, we can take a couple of questions, uh, maybe. Maybe I can ask something. Um, yeah. yeah, thanks for the talk. This is also something that I've been looking at it through for my PhD thesis, but not for visual part, but general question answering. So my first, the qu first question that comes to my mind is why did you decide to use this Wiki to VEC because the, there are, uh, or Wikipedia to VEC, there are, let's say, better models for graph, no, knowledge graph embeddings and so on. So like you could use something like a Wikipedia, which is basically the same as Wikipedia, but actually uses the knowledge graph itself, which is basically Wikipedia or something like a Wikidata and so on? Or is it something just a choice that you had at the moment? That's interesting. So, so what I, I was just using what Ebert used. So essentially I wanted to, since they had showed improved performance, um, that, so that decision was from the original Ebert okay. uh, work. Um, and so I continued with it, but using like stronger representations could possibly be useful. The one thing, I mean, I guess I would need to see it. Like here they're using, um, like word pieces and entities, sorry, words and entities into a joint space. And, and so it does have some concept of like, like their optimization, um, like their objective there is like pushing papers that are um, pushing links that are close to each other, like that refer mm -hmm. to each other, pages that refer to each other, closer to one another, uh, at, in, in addition to kind of the, the mass language model objectives that you would get from, um, mm -hmm. um, just using like a language model. So it has like, it's a multi-objective um, setup, the wiki to vec, but like, I need to look at the other ones. That could be an interesting improvement yeah. to this work. 
yeah. because that's exactly what basically any kind of knowledge graph embedding method would do so like you know yeah. europe and let's say north america they are basically continents right like if you look in the knowledge graph yeah. they are kind of related to each other through some relations between them yeah that's basically what it learns essentially and yeah and so this does that through like any pages that are linked to each other would be pushed together through the objective so i but i just don't know the, the exact uh graph representation you were discussing mm -hmm. yeah, yeah what so, was it again? yeah so you can just use like the search for i don't know knowledge graph embeddings and oh yeah okay, knowledge okay. Graph embeddings on like available knowledge knowledge graphs like dbpedia wikidata yeah yeah i just, guess their work showed this so that's kind of yeah, yeah. that makes sense yeah. and yeah. i would also suggest just a comment like also maybe for future work to maybe also try using like this kind of entity embeddings from different space, like maybe knowledge space, and then maybe you could compare it with this, like when you align oh, yeah. into the birth representation, right? So kind of see the yeah. difference, whether it actually makes sense or not. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, and there's, there's other things to do, like they actually do just a linear mapping between, um, like you don't have to actually use just a linear mapping, right? Um, that, that learn W unconstrained um, thing, they, you could make that a feed forward network. Um, and I've seen other papers do things of that sort. So that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah because like the en entities appear in natural language text, they have different context, right? I mean, all birth yeah. is all depends on how, how they appear, but in actual factual information of a linked graph entities and their relation between them, that's a different space. So ideally they don't have to represent same space in the end, right? So they, they could still be used to some extent. Yeah, yeah. Here, one of the limiting factors was, especially for the OKVQA set, since I didn't use the captions, it was, I mean, one was not using captions and the availability of like entities within the text, because this is, although it's a multimodal problem, it's seeing how much like advanced could you get by just tackling, enhancing the text representation. Mm -hmm. So another flip side is, could you do something similar to the image side as well? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the questions and the talk. So maybe show us you can end the session. Uh, yeah, all right. So um, thank you all. Thank you all authors. Thank you all the presenters for today. This has been our first edition of this workshop, and I wish it could have happened in, in presence. But given the circumstance, I think we will take it anyway. So my wish for future is that we could continue this uh, workshop in a bigger audience, hopefully next time in person. And maybe we could still co-locate it again with the next uh, conference uh, again on the, at dot 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 maybe or another similar one. And yeah, all, I also like to thank all, uh, especially our keynotes, our invited talks, and our reviewers who made sure that all the uh, present papers today were actually of high quality. And I don't see anyone from the workshop uh, chairs for the conference, but they also were really helpful in putting up this program together. So I think that's also a really difficult thing to do, but. We're here today and we did this workshop. It was, I think, good exchange. So yeah, I would like to thank you and I would like to wish you a pleasant uh, rest of the conference. And yeah, hope to you soon sometime in somewhere uh, in person as well. Thank you. Right. See you. See you everyone. Bye.